So good morning to all of you from the Digital Media Hub uh, at the United Nations uh, here, here in Vienna. And welcome to the launch of the 2020 annual report of the International Narcotics uh, Control Board. I'm the director of the United Nations Information Service here. And welcome to those in the room and those joining us over Teams or through our live stream on our website and uh, our YouTube channel. I will shortly hand over to the president of the International Narcotics Control Board, Cornelis de Jonquier, uh, to present the report and then take journalists' uh, questions. So welcome to you, Mr. President. Uh, journalists in the room uh, can ask their questions in, in the good old-fashioned way by raising their hands. And we have a boom microphone, which my colleague uh, Janine will bring around. And uh, journalists uh, following on Teams can sub they can submit questions, you can submit questions through the chat, and I will then be able to read them out uh, for the president to, to answer. And please do let me know when you're writing in the chat uh, which media organization you're from. And with that, Mr. President, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're suitably distanced, as you can see, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Nizerki, for the, uh, the kind introduction. So welcome all to the uh, launch of the annual report of the International Narcotics Control Board for 2020. Um, and that also includes our precursors report for 2020. As indicated already, I'm Kees de Jong, here. I'm the president of the International Narcotics Control Board this year. And the board is the independent quasi-judicial body established in 1968 to monitor and support government's implementation of the three United Nations International Drug Control Conventions. The board does so in cooperation with governments to ensure the availability of controlled substances for medical and scientific purposes, while preventing diversion, illicit manufacture, trafficking, and abuse. Our annual report our annual report presents an overview of the global drug control situation and makes recommendations to governments on how to better implement the provision of the treaties. Chapter one of the annual report is on a topic of a hidden epidemic drug use among older persons. Chapter two reviews the functioning of the international drug control system and includes an expanded section on the production and availability of controlled substances for medical use. The chapter three presents an analysis of the drug control situation by region and contains a chapter of global issues, including on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And chapter four presents recommendations for action by governments. The precursors report summarizes the action taken by governments and the board to prevent the diversion of chemicals to illicit drug production and to implement the provisions of the 1988 Convention. Our annual report this year is supplemented by a special report marking the 50th and the 60th anniversary of the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs and the 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances. These treaty mandated reports will be submitted through the Commission on Narcotic Drugs to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. So let me start with um, a, a short overview of the chapter one, a hidden epidemic drug use among older persons. We draw attention to the use of drugs among older people aged 65 and older and to the need to improve evidence-based prevention and treatment strategies for this age group. Older people have an increased vulnerability to drug use and to drug dependence. Research shows that drug use among uh, older people is increasing at a faster rate than among younger groups, highlighting an alarming trend. Data on substance use among the elderly are scarce and mainly from high-income country. However, there are many gaps in epi epidemiological data for older people, especially in low and middle income countries. 
The development of a range of health conditions and increased death rate is also associated with increased substance use among older people. Older people with substance abuse issues can be divided in two groups, the early onset users and the late onset users who began using drugs later in life. The reasons for developing drug dependencies are complex and are shaped by life experiences. Substance use can also be developed through overprescription of pain medication or misuse of prescribed medicines. We're also concerned that there is a general lack of attention to substance use issues affecting older people. And clearly this is also an important issue around the stigmatization for older people who use drugs. Substance use and polypharmacy among the elderly leads to higher risk of death from overdose, suicide and disease, as clearly uh, shown in the opioid epidemic in uh, particularly North America, but also in other parts of the world. The chapter also uh, presents a number of uh, recommendations, and we emphasize that substance use among older people need to be recognized as really a global health challenge. And only then can it be among this age group, can it be reduced and treated and can stigma be addressed. Treatment programs should be integrated and look at the physical health, mental health and drug dependency together to support older people long term. There are three areas that need to be addressed to combat drug use among older people. We need to increase research and get better data collection. We need to combat stigma and we need to have age appropriate care. We make a number of recommendations in the chapter. Among them, the improvement of the um, uh, monitoring systems that they should really be used to the full extent to gain a better understanding of the demand for treatment. Monitoring systems that are already now uh, monitoring prescribed medicine uh, should also uh, look at the possibility of um, reducing multiple prescriptions and prescription shopping. Countries should uh, consider to use innovative and new care technologies, for instance, like telemedicine, that would allow providers to provide substance use services to older people living in rural areas. And there's a clear need for better training of medical personnel to accurately recognize substance use abuse in older people and to be able to differentiate between similar symptoms of other illnesses and give age sensitive care. Training should be provided to address stigma, to remove barriers or discomfort of clinicians to probe for drug misuse with older people that are related to culture and social setting of the community. Let me move on to chapter two. The chapter two of the annual report reviews the functioning of the international drug control system and emphasizes that one of the fundamental goals of the convention is to safeguard the health and welfare of humankind. We focus on the promotion of the consistent application of the treaties and under this um, we look at the number of countries, almost all countries in the world have uh, adhered, have ratified and acceded to the conventions we report shortly on the, uh, the scheduling of new substances in the last C&D of March 2020. Um, and we also uh, report back on the reporting and information obligations that countries have vis-a-vis -vis the board. The second part there, we uh, look at the ensuring of the availability of internationally controlled substances for medical and scientific purposes. We uh, refer to the overall treaty compliance and we look at action taken to ensure the implementation of the drug control treaties and the support by the board to governments. Let me refer again to the availability of uh, drugs for medical and scientific purposes. This has been an issue that has been coming up every year in our annual report because we continue to see a huge gap between the availability of controlled substances for medical care between particularly higher income countries and low and middle income countries. Our estimates are that for instance in the area of uh, in, for the drug morphine that about 92% of morphine for licit medical use is being used by only 17% of the world population. 
this continues to be a, um, um, a, a, great, um, a great problem worldwide. We have repeatedly called on governments and the international community to address this. We have every four years we make a, a special supplement to the annual report to monitor the, um, the developments in this area. We've also, through the INCB learning program, we're working to build capacity of the national authority to improve the situation on the regulatory side. Another important issue that um, is a, almost a standing item in the annual report is um, Afghanistan. We focus um, every year on the situation in Afghanistan. We have invoked, the board invoked the provisions of the 1961 convention, the article 14 bis, following consultations with the government to bring about the support of the international community to counter, <clears throat> to counter the terrible drug situation in the country. In this context, uh, a delegation of Afghanistan participated in the board session in February 2020 and specific areas were identified where financial and or technical assistance by the international community is urgently needed, including from United Nations organizations and specialized agencies, as well as from other donors and partners. And we, these areas are described um, in the annual report. We stand ready to further facilitate support to Afghanistan through continuous engagement with the UN and other agencies and with members of the international community at large. Efforts to stabilize the country will not be sustainable without also effectively addressing the country's illicit drug economy. Let me refer to some of the um, uh, the actions that we're taking to uh, ensure implementation of the treaties and also the support by the board to, uh, to countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the important role that the international import and export authorization system plays in the international drug control system, the I2ES. Many countries initiated emergency procedures to expedite the authorization process for the illicit trade in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances in order to respond to the increased demand stemming from the pandemic. The board established a secure forum within the I2ES platform to enable competent authorities to exchange information regarding their special measures and to ensure the availability of controlled substances during the pandemic. Also, through our INCB learning, we held uh, training activities reaching 19 countries in four regions. And we've also developed um, e-learning modules which were launched in Spanish in March 2020. In less than one year, 812 government officials of 101 countries and territories enrolled in the e-learning modules. So that is clearly a beneficial side effect of the pandemic and our online culture that has evolved in uh, this last year. Another example is the, uh, the GRITS program, the Global Rapid Interdiction of Dangerous Substances that supports the rapid exchange of information and alerts among focal points networks under the INCB Project ION and the Opioids Project. It facilitates bilateral and multilateral operational actions that assist with investigations and provides participating agencies with practical solutions to stop trafficking in non-scheduled substances. In 2020, 11 confidential global alerts and special notices were circulated to GRIDS program focal points. And in 2020, about 50 training sessions attended by 1,108 officers representing 104 governments and international organizations were held on topics including information exchange using the ionics, intelligence development, awareness of new psychoactive substances, and safe handling and interdiction methods for opioids. The GRIS program also held several expert group meetings, bringing together internet domain name registries and registrars, internet search engine companies, social media companies, private postal and express mail operators, and express career services to collaborate with member states to prevent the exploitation of 
legitimate internet industries by traffickers of fentanyls and other dangerous substances. We've also released a list of 144 fentanyl-related substances that have been trafficked or seized, encountered in illicit internet sales, and manufactured and found in toxicology or related incident reports. Now moving to chapter three and the global issue, let me refer to the impact of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic on the availability of internationally controlled substances and on illicit drug activity. Since February 2020, lockdowns, border closures and disruption in manufacturing adopted by most countries to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 virus have affected the global supply chain of medicines. The surge in demand for medicines necessary for the treat, treatment of patients with COVID-19 further reduced the availability of several medicines containing controlled substances that are also critical in the treatment of other patients. Since March 2020, the board has received a, a range of requests by governments to increase their estimates and assessments of licit requirements for controlled substances. And a, number of, and a greater number of countries registered to use the import and export authorizations in electronic form in order to expedite the international trade. We've been working with competent authorities in all countries and raising awareness of the importance of ensuring availability. And together with UNODC and WHO also uh, issued a, um, a global statement uh, to draw attention of the international community of the importance of the keeping the flow of controlled substances uh, going in, um, in, in view of the increased demand. The mobility restrictions to curtail the spread of COVID-19 have caused disruption for patients who are treated for mental health conditions and also for drug users who cannot access drug, drug treatment services anymore. This not only has increased and aggravated drug use disorders, but also, but also the overall health of drug users. Patients do not dare to go to a hospital anymore. There may be shortages in supply of drugs that have led to the use of alternative means or administration, by, for instance, by injection, incurring additional risk, such as the spread of bloodborne diseases as HIV AIDS and hepatitis C. Measures introduced by governments to combat the spread of COVID-19 have also influenced illicit drug markets. Developments include a decrease in the availability of drugs and in, number, in a number of countries increased prices. The open web and the dark net markets, social media and secure encrypted communications, applications and online forums seem to be playing a more prominent role in the sourcing of drugs at the user level. Analysis of synthetic opioids and NPS seizures communicated through the board's Ionix platform shows a substantial increase in the proportion of seizures made in connection with postal services. We have hosted a series of webinars, discussion sessions and expert groups meeting, again, to raise awareness of the new trafficking trends and to support governments in uh, curbing these trends and finding solutions to address these new trafficking routes. Let me also briefly refer to a few other of the global issues, one of them being effective drug control as a means of fostering peace and security. We note that under the pretext of the, the war on drugs, policies in some countries have led to disproportionate and overly repressive responses without respect for due process and the rule of law. Such responses have contributed to an increase in violence and related death rates. We highlight that states should implement a comprehensive, integrated and balanced approach in drug-related responses. These approaches should be based on the principles of proportionality, shared responsibility, respect for human rights and the rule of law. This will contribute towards achieving the sustainable development goals, in particularly goal number 16, promoting peaceful and inclusive society for sustainable development, providing access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. 
Another global issue is the uh, issue related to drug terminology. Over the years since the conventions were adopted, we have seen that uh, the terminology has evolved and terminology that was used uh, 20, 30 or 40 years ago have gotten a different meaning. We emphasize the importance of the CND Resolution 6111 entitled Promoting Non-Stigmatizing Attitudes to Ensure the Availability of the Access to and Delivery of Health Care and Social Services to Drug User. The careful use of terminology can aid in preventing the stigmatization of drug use and dependence and promote the full protection of human rights. So we urge governments to examine their drug terminology for ambiguous usage or potentially stigmatizing effects that might have an impact on the ability of the international community to cooperate effectively on and jointly counter the world drug problem. The final issue I want to draw attention to is the genetic engineering and its implication for the cultivation of cannabis and the production of cannabis der derivatives in the context of the International Drug Control Convention. We call upon governments to ensure that these technologies are appropriately used with respect to the International Drug Control Conventions and the control measures that are foreseen uh, for, the, for cannabis in that respect, and to take steps that, uh, to prevent the misuse of that technology in the illicit production of drugs. Chapter 3 also includes an analysis of regional developments. So for each region, there is a short overview of developments there. But due to time limitations, I will not cover that now. Let me move to the Chapter 4 that has, uh, contains the recommendations to governments, uh, to the United Nations, and to other re relevant international and national organizations covering a wide range of areas. The recommendations stem from the chapter 1, 2 and 3 and cover the use of drugs among older people, um, issues on cannabis, the non-medical use and the cultivation for medical purposes, the importance for treaty adherence, again a series of recommendations related to the availability of sub controlled substances including during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a call for the respect to, uh, of human rights and um, the uh, proportionality and the rule of law when dealing with um, drug control policies, the importance of prevention and treatment, um, uh, a wide call again to improve data collection and reporting um, in all regions on the drug control situation, and then a series of reporting of um, recommendations also in the area of uh, precursors, which I will come to as well when I cover the precursor report. The INCB calls on all governments to carefully examine the report and to give due regard to the implementation of the board's recommendations in chapter four and also in the body of the report. The role that civil society has to play, particularly in drug use prevention and treatment, is acknowledged in the foreword of the report and is clearly critically important for countering the world drug problem. Let me move to the uh, precursor report. 2020 re precursor report marks the 30th anniversary of the entry into force of the 1988 convention. The report focuses on the diverse and complex landscape of precursor control and the sourcing of chemical raw materials. We see that the seizures of precursors and, uh, and of, uh, under international control seem to remain fairly stable and maybe even declining, which may indicate a shift to possible alternatives to the traditional controlled chemicals. On a promising note, we also see signs of increased capacity of law enforcement authorities around the world to identify and confiscate these substances. There's clearly a need for global joint action to address the use of non-scheduled chemicals, designer precursors and pre-precursors, and I will come to that uh, later. The global COVID-19 pandemic is having an impact on the illicit trade in precursors. The impact on trafficking is largely due to the general disruption in the international movement of cargo. 
Two aspects of concern with lasting implications are, one, the customized manufacture of chemical intermediates of active pharmaceutical ingredients that may be immediate precursors of narcotic drugs or psychotropic substances as a result of governmental efforts to avoid future supply chain disruptions. And secondly, the targeting by traffickers of manufacturing companies which have economic difficulties caused by the pandemic. The pandemic may also have impacted on the reporting by governments to the INCB. An analysis of global precursor trends will require more detailed reporting, in particularly under the circumstances of seizures, the suspected origin or points of diversion of the substances involved. At the same time, qualitative and quantitative improvements in intelligence exchange have yielded tangible results by establishing links between government seizures to reflect the continued operation of trafficking groups over several years. Diversion um, from licit trade channels is now largely domestic, and there's a need for an increased focus on domestic controls that will help to curb attempts by traffickers to target legitimate chemical and pharmaceutical manufacturers to obtain chemicals for illicit purposes. This is particularly important to prevent traffickers from approaching legitimate manufacturers for the customized manufacture of pre-precursors and chemical intermediates of synthetic drugs such as fentanyl and amphetamines. For the 30 precursors under international control, diversion from legitimate international trade has decreased substantially due to the increased use of the INCB pre-export notification system, the PEN online. Joint investigations have benefited from real-time information sharing through the Precursors Incident Communication System, the PICS, and the numbers are on your slide. Let me move to the issue of designer precursors. Over the last decade, the use of non-scheduled chemicals in the illicit drug manufacture, particularly of designer precursors that are purpose-made to circumvent controls, has started to proliferate. The board examined the matter in depth in its 2018 precursor report and called for a wider policy discussion at the global level to explore ways of getting ahead of the problem. The problem started with APAN, the international scheduling of which uh, took place in 2019, which is a precursor for amphetamine, and was followed by APA, and now recently um, MAPA, which was um, also scheduled by the CND last year. In March 2020, the board prepared a Commission on Narcotic Drugs conference room paper entitled Options to Address the Proliferation of Non-Scheduled Chemicals, Including Designer Precursors. The paper summarizes the challenges and presents a menu of options for consideration and further development to address this problem. And the board stands ready uh, to work with countries um, to achieve that. Let me finalize the precursor report with uh, some of the recommendations. Um, again, there's a need for the full utilization of the provisions of the Article 12 of the 1988 Conventions and the use of the limited international special surveillance list and other INCB resources, such as the list of substances not under international control that are under national control in some countries and consensus building under, under designer precursors. Clearly, there's a focus needed on the internet, both the clear web and the, uh, the dark web, which are playing uh, an, a, an, a growing role in the international trafficking of, um, of substances. We also recommend the governments that through PICS, all the incidents concerning precursors, non-scheduled chemicals and related materials are shared. Let me finalize with my last two slides on the, uh, the anniversary report. 2021 marks the 60th anniversary of the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs and the 50th anniversary of the 1971 Convention. The special report uh, reviews the achievement of the two conventions and highlights where further action is needed. 
and there will be a commemorative event at the upcoming CND in, uh, in April. Briefly on the uh, achievement, um, the two drug control the conventions, the 61 and 71, enjoy almost universal adherence, covering some 99% of the world population. The international drug control system established by the two conventions and also by the 98 convention has been able to largely achieve control of licit production, trade and consumption of controlled substances. There's virtually no diversion from licit international trade, even though the number of controlled substances has increased substantially over past decades. Throughout the world, the licit cultivation of narcotic plants and the licit production manufacture and distribution of and trade in these narcotic drugs has been successfully limited to the estimated quantities required for medical and scientific purposes. However, it's also clear that the estimates do not well reflect the medical needs in countries, hence the concern about the availability of controlled substances. For the 1971 convention, that has prohibited the use of substances in Schedule I except for scientific and limited medical purposes and have controlled licit manufacture. Again, diversion has been from licit trade and manufacture has been largely um, eliminated. But the, two, the anniversary report also refers to a number of uh, great challenges ahead to the international community. Main challenges are the, the implementation of the obligations under the conventions and their ability to ensure the availability for medical and scientific purposes while preventing diversion, illicit production, trafficking and abuse. The availability, as indicated already, is not satisfactory at the global level and will need further attention and energy to address that. In many parts of the world, prevention initiatives are insufficient or lacking. Treatment provision is poor and there are insufficient mechanisms to combat stigma and foster social reintegration. We also emphasize in the report that respect for human rights is a precondition for the development and implementation of effective drug control policy, as reaffirmed by member states in the outcome document of the 30th special session of the General Assembly uh, on the world drug problem. Continuing illicit cultivation of opium poppy, coca bush and drug trafficking threaten political, economic and social stability in a number of countries where corruption seriously hinders drug control efforts. We also see that there is still considerable imbalance between law enforcement measures and drug prevention and treatment interventions and an artificial separation of public health objectives and security objectives in drug control policies. The continuing emergence of a large number of new psychoactive substances on the global drug market poses a significant risk, as we have addressed in the annual report and the precursor report. On cannabis, we reiterate that the medical use of cannabis is allowed under the International Drug Control Conventions but that states need to comply with the treaty requirements that are designed to, pre to, um, to prevent diversion to non-medical use. And the board has expressed concerns over the adverse public health consequences of the increase in the use of non-medical cannabis. The conventions limit the use of cannabis exclusively to medical and scientific purposes. Again, we call on countries to, and the international communities to carefully address the drug trafficking issues related to internet. And this double anniversary looks back on the successful achievements of the 60 years of the single convention and 50 years of the Convention on Psychotropic Substances. But it's clear that substantial challenges remain. To conclude, and before taking any questions, I would like to emphasize that Implementation of the INCB recommendations as contained in the 2020 annual report and precursor report will contribute towards achieving the sustainable development goals, particularly goal number three, concerning good health and well-being. Working together to meet commitments under the international drug control system and in implementing the board's recommendations, 
governments can positively support their commitment to promoting the health and welfare of humankind. Our report draws attention to the protection of the rights of people impacted by the drug problem. We call upon governments to ensure that drug control measures fully comply with their commitments and obligations under the drug control treaties, as well as the international human rights standards and norms. Thank you very much for your attention. And with that, I hand back to you, Mr. Nizierki. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. President. Um, first of all, I'm going to turn to the room to see if we have questions there. Please, we have a, a question here, and then I will be going to the, the chat. I can see we have a number of uh, questions there, which I will come to. Thank so, you. So, uh, I'm Luis Lidon from the Spanish news ANCF. Um, could you elaborate on the negative effect of the, of the pandemic on the supply of medicines? It is due to a distribution problem or a, a production problem. Which countries are mm, were affected or are most affected? I ask this because um, we, we already know that before the pandemic, there was this global problem of the developing countries' lack, lack of access to, to painkillers. So I guess this, this problem is affecting mostly to rich countries. And they have a second related question. Are you concerned that pharma companies are focused only on the vaccines right now and are stopping to produce other essential medicines that are not so profitable right now? Thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. Um, again, the supply and excess issues are, are, are clearly multifaceted and uh, it's also difficult to get hard data on exactly what, what is happening. But there are clearly a number of factors. In the, in the start of the, uh, of the pandemic, um, uh, clearly uh, with the, uh, the initial border closures and some countries taking measures to, uh, to limit exports of, uh, of, of drugs and the overall disruption in cargo, um, a number of the, the world supply chains that are very often working on, on a sort of a just-in-time um, mechanism were clearly you know, not capable of bringing in sufficient quantities to, to different parts of the, uh, of the world. So that, that's one of the, one of the problems, um, simply the, the, the disruption of the, of the supply system. You know, export controls at that point in time um, may have helped the countries who, uh, uh, you know, kept drugs in their own country, but obviously may, ha may have hampered the access to those drugs in other countries because we clearly have a very globalized uh, world drug manufacturing system where not every, ev not every country in the world is producing its own drugs. There are a number of countries that basically concentrate, uh, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the drug manufacturer. In, in that respect, so as soon as you get disruption, you know that runs through the uh, run, runs through the whole system. So um, the other point, so that's purely the point on manufacture and, and transport and, and supply. Um, the other point is, of course, that with the um, uh, with the, the COVID situation and the, the the rapidly increasing number of patients that got hospitalized and got uh, into intensive care units where. Uh, the demand for a certain type of, uh, of drugs, including certain drugs that, that uh, contain controlled substances, was rapidly going up. So the, the, normal, the normal supply would not be able to, to satisfy that demand, and which also meant that uh, some people who um, you know, were, were using those drugs for other diseases may have had difficulties in getting access to that. We have better data from high-income countries, but obviously this must have been a problem in many of the low- and middle-income countries as well. And um, as we've seen in many parts of the world, and as we continue to see, um, the, the regular health care for patients who have other health conditions than, than COVID has really been um, you know, uh, underestimated and, and under um, uh, has, has been underpresented in this whole problem, but both in terms of uh, people who suffer from mental health conditions who, of, who often have difficulty in access those services, um, simply on one hand because of COVID, but and when they access the services, they may have experienced a situation where drugs that they would normally be using are not available anymore because they have been diverted to other patients or to other countries. 
And uh, the other issue that I referred to is the, um, again, people who are in treatment for drug use, drug use disorders, who um, also in, in that area, there has been a supply problem. So also those patients may have suffered in a, in a range of countries of not being able to either not, not having access to the facilities because the facilities may have, may have closed. People may not have dared to go to the facilities. And if they go there, they may not find the drugs that they need. In terms of drug development, um, yes, there is an enormous, um, um, there's been an, an, an incredible and actually an, an enormous achievement in developing vaccines for COVID basically within a year. That has been a, really a, a stunning achievement of the international community, both pharmaceutical companies, but also with a massive investment of, uh, of governments with, with public money. Um, normally, the companies that are um, investing in that, um, you know, are not necessarily investing in other type of drugs that may be that may be used under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. What you do see is that uh, increasingly there's R&D efforts also in antiviral drugs. That it's not just a vaccine, but also people who have um, have contracted the disease that they will have medicines available to uh, to treat them. So. I think those issues will run in parallel. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, another question in the room? So, right, let me go to uh, the, the, the chat here for questions from um, uh, journalists who are following on, on Teams. I have uh, two related questions from Heloisa Brogiato. She's from uh, Swiss Info. And she asks, uh, are there consultations between the board and Afghanistan regarding the availability of analgesic uh, opioids in that country? And uh, related to that, would it be possible to implement Article 14 BIS to offer technical assistance to Afghanistan to improve the availability of analgesic opioids in Afghanistan? Thank, thank you for the question. Um, yes, as I indicated, we had a, a um, we had the um, the deputy minister of uh, interior and and health officials from Afghanistan who visited the board in February 2020, and we had an extensive discussion on the uh, the drug situation in um, in Afghanistan, including also the uh, the availability of um, of um, uh, painkillers uh, for 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 medical use. Um, clearly, uh, this is a, a wider health system issue as well in Afghanistan, where um, you know the, the whole health system has been suffering over the last decades under the, uh, the very unstable uh, the political situation in, in the country. But in principle, of course, the, um, the availability, considering the, the production in Afghanistan, should not be a problem. But the, the, the actual supply obviously is a problem. Um, on the Article 14 BIS and our call on the international community to support Afghanistan in, um, in addressing the drug problem, we have repeatedly uh, called on the international community to, uh, to support the country in, uh, in this area. Um, clearly, the, uh, the political situation and the international security situation in, um, and the national security situation in Afghanistan continues to be very precarious and um, um, we're, we, we remain concerned that the international community is not sufficiently addressing this problem and that the connection between um, the drug economy, the overall, the, the country's drug problem and the security and the political stability situation is, is clearly not recognized sufficiently and uh, therefore we continue to call on the international community to support the country and address this issue um, uh, because without that uh, the political situation will not stabilize. But. Thank you very much. So we have a, a, another question and uh, well, two questions. Uh, forgive me, it's a little bit on the long side, but I think uh, I, I'll read it out for you. This comes from Soft uh, Secrets and this is uh, 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 the, um, based in the Netherlands and Spain for this uh, particular uh, reporting that they wish to do. They say, thank you for the detailed presentation. We have two related questions 
uh, with uh, regard to cannabis for medical purposes. Um, and uh, the first part is, despite mentions of the various initiatives uh, set up by INCB to support member states, the report and the press kit uh, makes apparently no direct reference to the initiative on cannabis, although it was launched in, in March 2020. And why is the initiative not mentioned, uh, despite having um, operated now for 12 months? And uh, the second part of the question, conversely, the report issues a recommendation, uh, number four on page 110, to be precise, on medical cannabis, uh, but recommends to member states only to allow the use of uh, cannabinoids and not uh, to botanical or traditional cannabis medicines. And how is this uh, reference uh, for uh, cannabinoids over cannabis um, explained by the board? And uh, they mentioned that as far as they're aware, the 1961 convention uh, mentions cannabis and cannabis resin, but not uh, cannabinoids. So those are the two. Uh, related questions for you, Mr. President. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm not totally sure I, I got, I understood the first part of the, uh, of, of, of the question, but uh, let, let me at least um, uh, uh, address the second one and perhaps that will also clarify a bit the, uh, the first part. Um, well, first of all, I, I think uh, where we get into the, uh, the, the pure medical side uh, of it, um, it is really not directly the mandate of um, um, of the INCB, but more it lies in the uh, to the uh, uh, to WHO and to the national health authorities to make decisions on the uh, the medical use on on cannabis. Where we refer to, uh, uh, to to cannabinoids, it was more in relation to the to the general principle that where you um, where you use substances for uh, for medical use. That in principle you would like to um, to have those substances being registered or those products being registered under a national pharmaceutical regulatory scheme, and um, that of course also has that that also uh, that normally has difficulties when you have botanical uh, or you, when you have plant-based products because the the very strict rules and regulations may be more difficult to apply in in that respect. Um, so that was more the, the background to, uh, uh, to, uh, um, to that statement. Of course, we realized that um, um, when cannabis um, in, or in 1961, when the conventions um, were, um, were adopted, that the, um, that the scientific uh, knowledge around cannabis and its composition was not what we have now. And uh, over the last uh, decades, a lot in that respect has changed. Um, therefore, also the, the, the point that when it became clear what the active ingredient, what the active psychoactive ingredient of cannabis was in THC, it got, it got uh, listed under the 1971 convention. So in that respect, there is, um, um, you know, we're, we're overtaken by, by time in, in that respect, and therefore there may also be uh, discrepancies in the, um, uh, in, in the way this is being presented. But I think the, um, the authoritative um, uh, review that was done by, uh, by WHO in, um, I think it was in 2018 18 already, and uh, which finally got voted, uh, the, the critical review on cannabis, which finally got voted by, by the CND, I think gives an, um, a good overview of the, uh, of the uh, also the, the medical and the, the clinical state of, of, of affairs of, um, of, of cannabis. Um, and as you know, the, the CND um, made um, you know, their decisions around that, uh, that critical review, and therefore we are where, where we are now. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, the two journalists uh, from uh, uh, Soft uh, Secrets, um, it's uh, Kenzie Ribolet and uh, Hugo Madeira, and uh, their, uh, their magazine uh, is published in, in eight uh, languages. And the first question they, they say was uh, on um, secrecy and uh, transparency around the uh, INCB cannabis initiative. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure about uh, what the secrecy of the, of the, the, the INCB cannabis initiative is. Um, 
perhaps you refer to um, uh, the conversation that the, the board has with, with countries, at least mm -hmm. uh, as you know, um, or as you may know, the, the board in all drug-related matters, we maintain a, a dialogue with, um, with countries, whether it is on cannabis, whether it is with Afghanistan on their drug situation, whether it is with other countries related to access to treatment and prevention or um, respect for human rights or rule of law there. Uh, with, with all countries, we, we are in dialogue. Um, and um, as you can see in the, in the board, um, in the, the chapter two, we, we briefly re we refer to those dialogues as well, but in fairly general terms. Um, we don't go publicly into detail on the discussions that we're having with individual countries. Um, that is not uh, foreseen under the under the, uh, the convention, so we keep though that dialogue with countries, a, di a confidential dialogue between uh, the board and, uh, and the country in question. Th uh, thank you. Um, the, the, the journalists uh, are wondering uh, whether this is also um, uh, related to d discussions with um, uh, stakeholders in the industry, meaning the, 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 the pharmaceutical um, industry. Um, well, I don't think so. Um, perhaps the, the, the initiative that you're, um, that you're also referring to is the initiative related to the, to the reporting on, uh, on cannabis. Um, yesterday we had a, um, an in, in, informal uh, consultation with, uh, with all member states on the, uh, the control and report, record, reporting requirements uh, uh, by the conventions to, uh, to the board. Let me give a bit of background uh, in that. Um, you know, over the, last, um, uh, over the last number of years, we have seen that there is a growing number of countries that is interested in producing cannabis for medical purposes. And we have seen that, um, that, that um, a number of countries is not totally clear and not totally aware of the control requirements that, um, that the conventions contain. And there are many questions how actually then to, to organize the, the national production. This is, if it's for medical use, this is allowed under the, uh, under the convention. Um, so first of all, there's a growing number of countries that um, uh, gets involved in the, um, the legal, the licit production of, um, of cannabis for medical purposes. Secondly, there's the issue of, um, and I briefly refer to that with the uh, genetic engineering, we have new varieties of, of cannabis plants. So um, when you go back to the 1961 conventions, um, uh, cannabis is clearly defined there, but uh, for instance, we, the, the, um, the new varieties that we have now from cannabis, for instance, may, t may contain uh, psychoactive substances um, in the leaves of the plant, which was not foreseen in the 1961 convention. So um, again, this is an issue where um, history, uh, you know, has caught up with us. So we need to see how, uh, with new varieties, how we um, bring those under the control requirements of the, uh, of the convention and that we have a consensus with member states uh, around that. There's also discussion around um, the industrial use of, um, uh, of cannabis, where the, where the 1961 convention exempts uh, cannabis for control when it is for industrial use, but it's not totally clear uh, um, to, or there's a difference of opinions uh, among parties on what is exactly uh, industrial use, and particularly also on the, on the, uh, the place of cannabidiol in the, uh, in the convention. So there, are a number of, of, of issues that um, have arisen over time that um, um, makes it important, that makes it, crit uh, makes it uh, mandatory for the board to really um, discuss this again with member states to ensure that we have a common understanding on what the control and reporting requirements are. We have, um, <coughs> so we, we started um, um, uh, in 2019 with a, um, a consultation with major cannabis producing countries, countries that at this point in time are already producing cannabis for medical purposes and are um, abiding by the control requirements. 
We've held an expert group, and uh, with the expert group, we're also, uh, we've also asked the industry to, uh, to share their knowledge and experience uh, uh, in the production of, uh, of cannabis, because they're the ones who are doing it. And now, over this year, we will be going through a whole range of consultations with member states um, to, uh, to ensure that we capture uh, all the input of the, um, of the authorities together with civil society. We also plan to engage um, uh, civil society, the non-governmental organizations in that. And uh, we will ensure that we, uh, um, we do this in an inclusive and a, and a, and a transparent manner. I hope that that clarifies them. I think it does. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Mr. President. I, I don't see any more questions in, in the chat at this point, and I'm just checking in case our friends here have any further questions. Doesn't seem to be the case, so I th think we'll uh, wrap it up there, um, Mr. President. Um, and uh, just to remind uh, to everybody who's following this that the uh, there are versions of the report available, um, faithfully translated into the, the, all of the official languages of the United Nations, in other words, um, Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, and Spanish, as well as uh, the English version. And uh, also, you will find that the press materials uh, we prepared are also available in, in, in six languages. And if you want further information on the report or the press kit, you can go to our website, and uh, we will put that uh, in our chat as well. And finally, I, I'd just like to thank you very much, Mr. President, uh, for being with us here today and for the, the very clear explanations and, and presenting the report for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.